Amen. Hey, who's excited to worship Jesus this morning? Come on, let's just, let's stand up on our feet as we get ready to worship. Lord, we love you this morning. Come on, sometimes you just got to take a moment to just posture yourself. Oh, we lift your name up high this morning, Jesus. Oh, we fix our eyes on you this morning, Lord. Yeah, you just begin to lift up your own song to the Lord. Oh, yes, Lord, this morning we choose to magnify your name in our lives. Come on, we choose to look away from anything that would try to distract us. Lord, we fix our affection. We focus on you today. Oh, we're ready to go for God this morning. Oh. Amen. We're going to learn a new song today. Come on, this is how the chorus goes. Oh, you are amazing, God, the everlasting one. You are the risen King. Oh, you are the sovereign God. You reign victorious. You are the risen King. Let's sing that one more time. Sing, oh, oh. like that the everlasting one you are you are the reason king yeah you sound good sing oh you are the sovereign god you reign you reign victorious you are the reason king let all let all creation sing Here we are, here we are, open arms, every heart overcome by your love and freedom. Here we stand, lifted hands unto the King. Hey, come on, sing this every day. And every day, giving thanks, bringing our everything to the one deserving all the praise that our hearts could ever sing come on you know these words now sing oh and oh you are amazing god the everlasting one you are the risen king sing oh and oh you are the sovereign god you reign victorious sing let all creation let all creation sing hey i feel the joy of the lord today sing every day every day every day giving thanks bringing our everything to the one deserving all the praise that our hearts could ever sing Jesus, we lift your name on high, 
Oh, your glory fills the sky forever. We live to sing your praise. Oh, glorious one, you reign. Come on, sing that. We lift your name on high. Oh, your glory fills the sky forever. We live to sing your praise. Oh, glorious one, you reign. Oh, come on, sing We lift your name on high. Oh, your glory fills the sky forever. We live to sing your praise. Oh, glorious one, you reign forever. Oh, come on, lift up a shout this morning. It's my choice. It's my joy to bring you praise. It's my joy. Sing oh. this morning and he reigns he reigns forever you reign over sickness lord forever you reign over addiction today Jesus. You say you reign forever. Yeah, let's just take a few moments right now if you haven't already just begin to focus on the presence of God on his matchless name. Come on he's beautiful and worthy of all praise today. Thank you Jesus. the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises, he hears faith. Yeah. There is a sound I love to hear it's the sound of the Savior's robes as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Hallelujah. Sing his praise aloud, 
sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. The sound that changes things, the sound of these people on their knees. Oh, wake up, you slumbering, it's time to worship Him. Awake, oh, my soul, and sing, sing His praise aloud, sing His praise aloud. This morning, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. Come on, you choose praise this morning. Come on, Lord, we make a decision today. We make a decision today to choose praise, to choose magnifying that precious name that is Jesus. Come on, we can choose other things but we choose praise. We can choose to put our hope in other things, but we choose to put our hope in the name of Jesus. Come on. So when we praise, we know things change. 
Because God inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Let's sing when we praise things. When we praise things change. Come on. When we praise things change. When we praise things change. Mountains mount like wax in your presence, Lord. When we praise things change. When we praise things change. When we praise things Oh, let's sing one more time when we praise. When we praise things change. When we praise things change. When we praise things change. Sing awake my soul. Awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Come on, can we just lift up a shout of praise here this morning? Hallelujah.
stands above them all. Hey! All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions in your name stands above them all. Jesus! Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. and daughters, God, lifting up your precious name. Think about that, the holiness of God. The angels circle around and sing. Holy, holy. Twenty-four elders cry. Holy, holy. Yes, Jesus. There is no one like you.
to be praised. You are Alpha. You are Alpha. And Omega. We worship. Sing that one more time. The beginning and the end. Sing Alpha. You are Alpha. And Omega. We worship you. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lift up your voice to the mighty one. Lift up your voice to the only one. The only one worthy of praise. The only one worthy of honor. The only one worthy of glory. Would you just lift up your voice right now in your own voice?
David said, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Sometimes you have to tell yourself. You have to say, self, it's time to get lined up with God right now. And we're going to praise him. We're going to exalt him no matter the circumstance, no matter what's going on around me. I'm going to praise the Lord with everything that's in me. I'm going to praise his holy name for he is worthy and he is worthy. And he is the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord of all. Lord of all. He says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So many benefits. Who forgives all your sins. Has he forgiven you? Then praise him right now. Say, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. You washed me clean. You made me new. Thank you, Jesus. And he heals all my diseases. Has he healed you? Then praise him. Thank you, Lord, for healing me, for touching my body. God, we thank you. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion God you gave me such love you poured out your compassion upon me and you redeemed my life I was going in a direction that would have destroyed me but you redeemed me you called my name he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. God, thank you. Thank you for strengthening me when I am weak. Thank you for coming and renewing me and restoring to me the joy of your salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you lift your hands and just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are so good to me. You're so good to us. You're so good to your people. The joy of my salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I know that those days are not past. You continue to renew. You continue to strengthen. You continue to redeem. You continue to heal and save, God. Thank you, Jesus. I know the Lord told me to do something very specific this morning in this worship time. But I need to ask a question. Do you believe what we just read, that God still heals? Do you believe that? How many of you with an upraised hand would say, I know it because I've experienced it? Amen? We have several individuals in our family that are struggling right now, even battling some of them very serious things. And so the Bible says in James chapter 5 that, that you're to call the elders of the church and you're to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And it says, is there any sick among you? Sometimes among you doesn't mean that they're here physically in the building because they're so sick they can't be. So I want us to pray for those among us, those that are part of the family. And so, Donalina, will you come? Donalina is going to stand in for our new friend, Gaylene, who is at Baylor, right? She's at Baylor Medical Center right now. And she's battling for her life right now. And, I, and I'm, I don't, that's not a dramatic. And so we want to pray for her. I'm going to ask, would you come, Michael, Seth, and would you just stand behind a couple weeks ago, God just dropped it on Michael Seth's heart to pray for Gayleen. And I believe that we're going to come together in agreement. Amen? Amen. One of, one of our new brothers who is such an incredible man of God, Al Reaver, just went through knee surgery. 
and it was, he's been doing well, but, but he's struggling right now. John, would you come and stand in for Al Reaver? Jonathan, just come and stand right here. And Brother John, would you stand behind him? We're going to agree in prayer here. We're going to anoint with oil as if they were standing right here. Then I need a, a couple. Do I have a couple that would come and stand in for Wendell and Patty? Somebody? Bill and Cheryl, y'all come. Y'all stand in for Wendell and Patty with two individuals that are full of faith come and stand. They've been battling actually two different things. And, and so we need to stand in for them. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the next thing. Those are the three I know of. There may be more. If you have someone in your life that is very near to you that you want to stand in for, you say, I wish they were here, but they just can't because of their struggle. Would you come and stand next to these in the line? And we're going to pray. And we're going to believe God. So if you have somebody that you want to stand in for, would you come? Amen. Amen. I'm doing this in a very deliberate, orderly manner because I really believe the Holy Spirit directed this. Can I get three faith-filled individuals to just come and stand behind these? Now I need four. One more over here. Just come and stand behind. Church, look up. Open your eyes. Would you come and stand behind? Now here's what I want us to do. If you're sitting, would you stand? And stretch out your hand. And I'm going to go down this line. And it's going to take a minute or two. But if you're sitting, would you stand? And I, want, and I want you to do that as a prophetic act of saying, I'm standing with these. I'm standing with those in our body that are struggling physically right now. And we're going to agree in prayer. Can we do that right now? Just begin to lift up your voice in prayer. Let's come together as the family of God. And let's pray for one another. In Jesus.
stripes so we are healed and he's come to heal us today by his stripes so we are healed and he's come to heal us today oh the healer is in the room and he's making all things new oh the healer is in the room and he's up the name of Jesus now and say thank you God for your healing power thank you for your healing power thank you for your delivering power thank you for your touch God thank you Lord thank you Lord then reach over and touch somebody next to you right now and just begin to worship together for a moment just let the worship just be lifted to Jesus come on Come on. I've seen you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. I'll see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way. And I believe. I'll see you do it abundantly above all we could ask think or imagine God even healing is gonna flow out of the individuals you're healing now God that healing is gonna flow to the next hospital bed that healing is gonna flow to the next bedroom that healing is gonna flow wherever they're at God that healing is gonna flow so powerfully God we thank you for that in Jesus name in Jesus name now why don't you just hug that person you've been worshiping with come on Wow, 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 wow. Did you greet a couple of people on the way down? Amen. Praise God. Aren't you glad? You may be seated. Aren't you glad for a church who believes? But more importantly than that, aren't you glad for a God who hears and answers? Amen. He is the God who hears and answers. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm so glad that you are here today. I'm Pastor Ricky, lead pastor here at New Day Church, and just so thankful that you are with us, and along with my wife Joni and our leadership team, we want to say welcome, and for those of you that are watching online, just jump in. You can jump in right where you're at, and for those that we're praying for, you can even put on there wherever, wherever those chat boxes are, say, hey, this is what God is doing in my life, and we would love to hear from you. 
Well, listen, I've got just a couple of things that I want to mention um, before we move on with the service. Uh, I want to, and I know we've been doing announcements at the end, but just real quick because I want to do something special at the end. I want us to uh, let you know that on next Sunday, say next Sunday so I can get on track. <laughs> you know, it's hard sometimes to transition. I don't know about you, but it's sometimes it's just like, Phew. so next Sunday, next Sunday is going to be right after the service, our new partners meeting. In other words, if you have considered being a partner at New Day or you want to know what's going on or why we do what we do or where we came from, then this is the meeting for you. Or if you've been a part of New Day for a long time and you just never made that next step, it's time to make that next step to see what God wants to do. We believe in our partners. We believe that uh, Paul was very clear that even with those who supported his ministry, they were partners in the harvest. And so that's what it's all about. We want us to be partners together uh, doing this because we cannot do it alone. Amen. And then the Sunday after that is April 28th, and we are going to be having something that I don't know that we've done it this way or announced it this way, but we're announcing it. We are going to have a Miracle Sunday. Amen? You say, can you, can you, can you say that? Yes, we can. We are going to believe for signs, wonders, and miracles on the 28th. Now you say, well... Hopefully you believe for that every Sunday. Yes, absolutely. But what I want you to do is I want you to begin to build your faith. You see, when Jesus was coming into town, you wonder how he gathered those crowds, right? How did he gather those crowds? They didn't have megaphones. They didn't have, uh, you know, YouTube. They didn't have social media. How did they gather the crowds? People began to run through the streets and say, Jesus, the healer is coming. Jesus, the baptizer is coming. Jesus, the one who redeems people is coming. And they begin to go throughout. So that's why we're announcing it two weeks out. We want you to tell people, hey, if you need a healing, if you need a touch from God, if you need a deliverance, if it, it, prodigals, whatever it is, invite them especially to that service. And that morning, I'm believing that God is just going to pour out his spirit in a special, special way. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I think that's what we've got is just a couple of those announcements. And we've also got someone uh, with us, a guest with us, and we'll announce them at the end. Uh, but right now I want Johnny to come, and he's going to receive our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Let's welcome Johnny. Good morning, church. Uh, I want to share a little story because I think it's really cool that we're doing uh, a Miracle Sunday. So um, this past summer, I was an intern in El Salvador. I served there for two months. And one of the times when we were doing ministry, we went across El Salvador eight hours to a city uh, called Perkin. And so we packed up the bus. We put all the sandwiches and all the toys that we needed because we always want to attribute something physical that's good with the spiritual good. So we give a gift to every single kid so they can feel loved because a lot of these kids have never had a gift given to them. So we packed all the stuff, and I was a part of that packing process as someone who was, you know, working and interning there. And we go there and we do ministry all week. And we packed about, uh, we packed about 500 toys, um, about 500 sandwiches. But more specifically, we packed 500 toys. And at the end of the week, the, the missionaries that I was working with, the nationals, they would count and see how many kids we actually reached. And we reached and gave over double the toys that we had. We had 500 toys, and we reached over 1,000 kids, and we had leftovers afterward. We had boxes and trash bags full of toys that we left at the church that they kept and kept on giving. So what that shows me is that when you're obedient, when you simply just say yes to God, he will be there, whether it's financially or relationally or spiritually, you're going to see a blessing when you're simply obedient. And that's what it is. So I'm fired up. Uh, so we have three ways that we can give here at New Day Church. And when you give, you help the mission of God go forward. It's as simple as that. You help the church go forward. You help missionaries go forward. You help the spread of the gospel go forward when you give. So we have three ways to give. You can give. You can scan to give right there. And we have our ushers who will come and collect and I believe there's a number you can text or you can give online at newdaychurch.org. 
newdaydfw.org. I was close. But uh, I'm going to pray and hand it back over to Pastor Ricky. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for dying on the cross for our sins and rising again and making miracles possible in the process, conquering sin and death and paying the ultimate price, Lord. Yeah. We say thank you, Lord, and we say thank you for what you're going to do with our simple yes, and you're going to multiply it, Lord, for your work in your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. And at amen. this time, wait, 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 the children. Wait, wait, wait. Almost, almost, almost. I wanted to say something that today is the last Sunday that we will see Johnny for a little bit. So, yes, I know, I know, I feel the same exact way. Johnny came to us as an intern, um, I guess it was about last October, September, October. And actually, Johnny had been in this church uh, about two years before that, and we didn't know him at the time, but he came and helped with our VBS. And it, he was just such an inspiration and such an incredible young man that when I saw him at Southwestern two years later, when we were trying to get interns to come, I was like, I know you. And he was like, I know you. And then it clicked where we had seen each other. And so he filled out the application and he became one of our very first interns for this season. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And I can honestly say that we've had many interns over the years, all lovely people, incredible people. But I can honestly say this, that Johnny, you are at the very top. And God has used you in ways beyond you'll even ever know. It'll take heaven to tell the impact you've made, especially upon our young people, but also upon us older people. And we are so grateful for you and thankful for you. And we just wanted to pause and say thank you so much for coming and pouring your life out. Amen? Amen. Love you too. Amen. Yeah. Now, kids, you can head out as they receive this morning's tithes and offerings. And I want to let you know that Wednesday, Johnny will be here, as well as one of our other interns, JC. And we are going to be celebrating, or the youth will be celebrating them. And if you'd like to just say thank you to them in any way, JC has a missions trip. Uh, actually an internship in El Salvador this summer that she's raising funds for. And if you want to be a part of that, you can ask us how you can do that through the church or you can do it directly through them. But we just wanted to say thank you. Amen? Amen. I know I've asked you to stand multiple times, but would you turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 10 and stand with me? Mark chapter 10. Isn't it a beautiful day? Yes. Amen. Gorgeous day. This weekend was just amazing. How many of you had a really good weekend? I, I mean, I got to spend yesterday with three of my grandkids. It was incredible. It didn't matter if the sun was out. They were out. It was so much fun. So I hope you had a good weekend this weekend. But if you didn't, listen, it's not over yet. Amen? It's not over yet. So... Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Isn't that a powerful passage, just that line? The, dis the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Here's my, here's my advice, my pro tip for the day. Be a disciple and not simply a follower. I'd rather be astonished than afraid. Amen. Goes on and says again, he took the 12 aside and he told them what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. How I many of you know Jesus didn't hold any punches with those who were closest to him? He did not always share with the crowds, but he always shared with those closest to him. Another pro tip, get close to Jesus. And he will speak to you. Things that will blow your mind. Amen? 
Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your precious, honorable, amazing, living word. God, I thank you for the word of God that separates not just truth from lies, but separates what we wish would happen and what really is going to happen. God, I thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. I thank you, God, for your word that brings life, brings breath, brings so much to us. God, I just pray in the name of Jesus that your living word will not just impact us today, but it will transform us and change us more into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to preach to you a message today that I've entitled, My Pleasure, Servants in a Selfish Society. How many of you know that it doesn't take much to go out to a restaurant and recognize that society has changed in the last few years? It's like the recipes haven't changed. The quality of the food necessarily hasn't changed, although some of them it has. But what has changed in society that you can get a clue from restaurants is the level or lack thereof of service. You know, we call it hospitality industry, but did you know they used to have a different word for that industry? Does anybody know what it was? It was the service industry. It was the service industry. In other words, whether you're talking about restaurants or hotels or even airlines, uh, I mean, any of those things, they called it the service industry because it was built on serving the customer or the individuals that came into contact with you. Now, how many of you have ever heard of that one restaurant that is affectionately and not officially called the Lord's Chicken. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. What is it? Come on. What is the Lord's Chicken? It is Chick-fil-A, and they are closed today. Oh, sad day. They are closed today. Chick-fil-A founder Truett S. Cathy was visiting a Ritz-Carlton hotel when an employee caught his attention. Every time Truett Cathy thanked the employee, he'd respond, my pleasure. This exchange left an impression on Truett, who felt that it was a nice way to tell someone that you were pleased to serve them. So at the 2001 annual Chick-fil-A Operators Seminar, Truett challenged around 900 operators to swap out your welcome or no problem with my pleasure. You can't say my pleasure without looking them in the eye, he told the crowd. And Truett felt that eye contact helped to create a personal connection with customers. Now, a little bit later, Dan Cathy and Truett Cathy explained that my pleasure is an expression from the heart. Team members, operators, or staff members are able to literally show that they want to go the extra mile and that they care about the other person. They have enough value in the other person to exceed expectation, they wrote. Those two little words represent warm hospitality and a desire to serve. Now, if someone serving you chicken and waffle fries and a sun joy, which is my favorite, if someone serving you that can take enough thought to think, I want to connect with you in these few moments that we exchange cash for that little pleasure of that food. How much more should the church of Jesus Christ be prepared and ready to be servants of those we come into contact with? So when we talk about that, we look at this Mark chapter 10, and Jesus begins to share his innermost heartfelt understanding of what's about to be portrayed, what's about to happen in their lives. 
he begins to pour out his heart to them. And right after he does that, look at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, God named, or Jesus named, James and John, the sons of thunder. And I think we understand why in this passage. These guys were bold. They were bold. They came to Jesus and said, Glenn, before, before we ever got the scripture that you can ask whatever you want in my name and it will be done, before they ever got to that, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. That's bold, super bold. And you can decide for yourself from Jesus' reaction whether or not it was maybe too bold or just right. Jesus said in verse 36, what do you want me to do for you? I love it. Don't you love it when Jesus asks questions instead of answering right up front? He says, what do you want? sons of thunder what do you want me to do for you and they replied verse 37 let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory Hmm. simple request we just want to be your right hand man and your left hand man now what did that really mean what did that mean to a jewish mindset It really meant about what it would mean to you and me. I want to be right next to you. I want to be the commanding officers when you come and start kicking tail of the Romans. We want to be right there in your glory. They weren't talking about heavenly glory. They were talking about earthly glory. We want to be right there. We'll be by your side. It'll be like the three amigos coming on out and just destroying everybody. That's where we want to be. And then when it's all said and done, we want to sit at those thrones. We want to sit in that place of glory and accolade because we were right there with you. Too bold? Jesus, verse 38, answered, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Did he not just tell them what exactly was going to happen? Betrayal, torture, and death. And he's like, Guys, can you handle betrayal, torture, and death? Because if you're going to be at my right hand and left hand in all my glory, that's what you've got to face. And then (laughs) their boldness just blows me away. Verse 39, two simple words. We can. I mean, you can read it however you want. We can. Either way, they said it, we can. And Jesus said to them, you will. (laughs) You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Let me stop and say this. You need to understand when you come to God with your questions, when you come to God with your request, sometimes we're seen in the temporal realm, but he is always seen from the eternal realm. He's always playing the long game. He's always thinking with eternity in his mind. And if we could just get in tune with that, Solomon said eternity is planted in the heart of every human. If we could begin to tap in, Lord, I know I'm asking for now, so help me to ask for forever. He goes on in verse 41 and says, when the ten heard about this, they were like, dude, we wish we would have been first. 
Why didn't we think of this first? What does it say? It says they became indignant with James and John. They called them together and said, you know that those, or excuse me, then Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Can you say those four words? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your, what is it? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. You see, Jesus said, you cannot take on this world's style of leadership and expect to go far in my kingdom. You've got to become low so that I can raise you high. You've got to serve others so that I can lift you up. You even have to become a slave to everyone else before I'll ever put you in front of everybody else. And then he says this, and this, if you don't hear anything else in this message, listen to verse 45. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. I don't care what position you hold. I don't care where you think you are in your company or in a church setting or in your family. Jesus, the king of all kings, we sang about him. His name is higher than any other name. His name is greater than any other name. God raised him to the place of authority over judgment, over everything in the universe. And he said, I came to serve. I came to serve. Which makes me think of this statement. If serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. If serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. You will never experience true leadership in the kingdom of God as long as it's all about you. Serving others is a key factor in the word of God and in the kingdom of God. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Paul said this, to the church at Philippi, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Wow. Can you imagine if we started teaching athletes and musicians this? Would that maybe change those two industries just a little bit? Hmm? I think it would change it a lot, too. I agree. Then he says this, verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. You know what the word in Greek is For nothing, do you know what the translation of that Greek word nothing is? Let me tell you what it is. It means nothing. It means completely empty. It means nothing. It means he put himself on the lowest plane level. And you say, how could Christ do that? I've even heard some, and I won't say preachers' names or whatever, but he's, there's some preachers who go, oh, yeah, God, you know, he got, you know, if you came from the kingdom of heaven and came to the kingdom of earth, that's the lowest place. But it even means lower than that. It means he came to be a servant to everyone, even you and me. Whoa. Can you imagine Jesus showing up in physical form right here? What would be the thing you and I would do? I know what I would do. I would fall on my face as quickly as I could. If Jesus came in his earthly form and showed up in this room, I'd be on my face. Why? Because he's Lord of all. And yet he chose to come and show us the way by getting in the lowest form. And it says it right there. Taking the very nature of, 
not just of a human, but of a servant human being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, remember. The Philippian church, all of the churches here understood this statement, even to death on a cross, because not only did they know that Jesus died, but at that moment, their brothers and sisters, many of them, some of their physical family members and definitely the family of God were being used as torches in Nero's gardens as they would impale these Christians and then light them up. Some were being placed on crosses because they said, oh, the symbol of the cross is sacred to you? Well, we're going to crucify you just like we crucified your Lord. Some disciples chose to be crucified on the cross. They didn't choose to be crucified, but their captors said, you're going to be crucified. And they said, do not crucify us like our Lord. Crucify us upside down. They became obedient even to death on a cross because they were following their Lord. Jesus became obedient to the Father. And that, I don't know about you, but it's got to be one of the biggest theological conundrums. Come on. Can we be thinking believers right here? That God himself, in the form of Jesus, would become Death on the cross, that's crazy. I've been to Bible school. I've had some training outside of that. I've studied, and it's still a mystery. How did that even happen? But I know it did. And I know that my Lord took that death not because He wanted to show off, not because he was seeking some higher place. He did it because he was a servant and he served me even in his death. But then verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I know I'm taking a lot of time in Scripture to lay a foundation for this, but if we don't get this, we get very little in the kingdom, is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate example. He is the one who leads us into victory, but he got to that victory through suffering. And he says, come and follow me. And millions say, yes, I want to come and follow him because that means health, that means wealth, that means wisdom, that means I'm going to be on high. And they don't realize that he also said, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus became the servant of all and God exalted him to the highest place. I know that we, as the, this part of the New Testament church, are still working on this idea, but it seems like a lot of the early, early church got this concept of servanthood by following Jesus. You know, think about the apostles for a minute. What do you think their business card What do you think their contact card on their phone said when somebody said, hey, Peter, will you share with me your contact card? Sure, let's just bump phones and we'll trade contacts. What do you think it said? I don't know. I think that in Scripture we see it. In 2 Peter 1.1 it says, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. In James, James 1.1 he says, James called himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, the great apostle, said in Romans 1, as a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. What about other leaders? Well, Paul, we already know, but Timothy in Philippians 1 was a servant of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people. 
Then Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus in Colossians 4.12. In Jude 1.1, Jude says about himself, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. And if you really want to go old school, let's go to Moses found in Revelation 15.13. Moses, John the Revelator said, simply, God's servant. God's servant. So if we look not only at Christ, but we look at his apostles, his prophets, his teachers, those who were in leadership in the church, those who were pastors over the church, shepherds over the flock of God, all of them looked at themselves, first of all, not as those titles, but as the servant of Christ. In the kingdom of God, Whatever your title is, your position should always be a servant. Let me say that again. In the kingdom of God, whatever your title is, your position should always be servant. Servant. Look at the archangel assigned to John the Revelator in the book of Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I'd heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. So think about this. This is an angel who serves at the pleasure of God in the very throne room of God, who had been showing these things to me. Verse 9, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. And then the angel said, worship God. Worship God. Let me tell you something. There is no one worthy of a bowed knee except for God himself. There is no one worthy of your worship except him. There is no one that is deserving of your praise except him. He is the only one. No angel, no prophet, no apostle, no pastor, no leader in your life is worthy of a bowed knee except Jesus. He is Lord of all. And if anyone tries to bow their knee to you, I hope you quickly pick them up. So watch this. If you're in too high of a position to serve, then you're in too high of a place to grow. If you're in too high of a position to serve, then you're in too high of a place to grow. You see, if you're at the top, there's no more growth. That's the practicality of it. And I don't know about you, but I always want to be growing in the grace and the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ. I always want to be growing. And so, therefore, I need to keep, keep my heart positioned as a servant so that I can continue to grow. As my daddy would have said, you're too big for your britches. People get too big for their britches. You remember that little slave girl in Acts that followed Paul and Barnabas around and yelling out a certain phrase? They were yelling, or she was yelling, these are servants of the Most High God. She may have been uh, under the influence of demons, but even demons know servants of God. And she recognized that. You see, the most important thing we can understand in the kingdom of God is that we serve Jesus. As servants of God, we first serve him. We may be a friend of God, as we sang last week. We may be a child of God, as we love to say. We may even be one of these other titles, but we will always, always, always be a servant of God. You see, I feel like that this title has been lost in the church today. I feel like we get so caught up in things and so caught up in, in different things of our life. And we're like, well, I'm this and, you know, this is what business card says. But we've got to get to the place where we say, God, I'm always your servant. And even in that position, even in that title, if I'm a president, if I'm a CEO, if I'm a teacher, if I'm, if, if I'm a, a factory worker, if, if I work at a bank as a president of a bank, I'm always a servant. This reminds me of a story. Joni and I were privileged to go several times in person to the great Brownsville revival that God moved 
in Pensacola, Florida in the mid-90s. And I remember that there was an usher on one of the services that we were there. Actually, we were there for several services. And I remember seeing this same usher over and over again. He was, I mean, back then, you know, the 90s, everybody wore a suit in church. And so, so he had a nice suit on, but he was just serving and he would come. He would receive offerings. He would come and say, hey, do you need anything? If someone was being prayed for and Steve Hill was going nuts and praying for people in the balcony, then that guy was there ready to help people along, you know, to help people to the floor as the Holy Spirit took them over. I mean, whatever, this guy was just ready. And I remember, I thought, you know, this is interesting. I mean, because literally they were going sometimes five, six, seven days a week in this revival. And he was a local person. And I remember that. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to ask him a couple of questions. So I said, before a service, I said, let me ask you a couple of questions. And I talked to him about, you know, hey, how has the revival changed your family? And he's like, well, sometimes we're here till 2 a.m. He said, so I know families with small children who literally now homeschool their children. They pulled them out of public school so they could homeschool them, so they could be a part of this move right now, so that we could have a later schedule. We sleep in in the morning, or they would sleep in, and then, I mean, it literally transformed families, even their schedule. You see, we all want revival, but we don't got, want God to change our schedules. God, we want revival as long as it's convenient. God, would you bring a convenient revival to America? Mm, That'll be for another message. And so here he is, and here's this guy I'm talking to, and he's, he's going back and forth just being so kind. And then I, for some reason, popped in my head, hey, what do you do as for a living? He said, I'm the president of this bank down the street. I said, well, wait a minute. I said, you're the president of the bank. He said, yeah, we have this many banks in the southeast. I'm the president. I said, let me get this straight. I said, you're the president of the bank, but you're an usher at church. Shouldn't you be like over the finance committee? (laughs) Shouldn't you be like the head? I mean, this guy wasn't even the head usher. Shouldn't you be like at least the head usher? He said, I serve at the pleasure of Jesus. That is the attitude we've got to come at. Not not only do we serve Jesus, our first and most important service, but we also serve our family. Come on, somebody. Ephesians 5 says, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for the body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Then Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And it goes on and on and on. Wives, respect your husband. There's so much about that family that that in the word of God, we are commanded, not just told, we are commanded to serve those closest to us. There are numerous other scriptures on how we will even treat our brothers, our sisters. Watch this. Even our parents who are aged. Our parents who, we're out of their house. We're from underneath their control. What are we to do with those parents? We're to honor them. We're to love them. I personally know missionaries who were incredibly effective on the field that have come off of the field to serve their parents in their remaining years. But you say, that's wrong. They should be on the field. That's where they're seeing thousands come to Christ. They're seeing the church raised up. They're, They're over Bible schools. Why would they come home to take care of their parents? Because they believe the scripture. And they said, and I've talked to them. Some of them are like, I know I want to be on the field, but this is a season that I'm in right now. So I'm going to serve my family well. I know people who have said no to corporate jobs so that they can say yes to the calling of God to their family. But what does society say? Society says, no, you don't need to stay home and take care of your kids. You need to let somebody else take care of your kids. You need to climb the corporate ladder. 
And even me saying that causes a cringe among some because you're like, oh, is he this, is he that? Well, you'll have to have a private conversation with me about that. What am I talking about? I'm talking about first we serve Jesus. And then who does he tell us to love? Those among us, our family. We got to serve them. Does that does that mean that a man or a woman can't have a corporate job and have a family? That's not what I'm saying. As I said, you'll have to talk to me privately. What I'm saying is get to the heart of the issue. We've got to serve those that are closest to us. Because when we serve our family, we're serving others like Jesus served them, according to Scripture. Thirdly, we serve the body of Christ. Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. Then look at Galatians chapter 6. Let us not become weary in doing good. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Say all people. Because I'm going to get to that in a second. But what does he say right after that? Especially give attention to those who belong to the family of believers of the household of faith. The Word of God tells us that we are to serve Jesus by serving our family and by serving the family of God. I, I've always been blown away by this scripture because I know people who are like, man, we got to go for the lost, we got to go for the lost, we got to go for the lost, and if the church wants to catch up, I'll let them catch up. And it's kind of this attitude of of the body of Christ is just kind of over there. And yet, Scripture tells us, especially consider those who are of the household of faith. Amen? So as we serve one another in love, what did Jesus say? He said something so important about this to his disciples and to us. He said that the world would know that we are disciples by our love for who? One another. Whoa. Michael, Seth, if you and I are out at a restaurant and we're connecting, and as the, as the server does, and I promise you, that server is listening to what you're talking about at the table. Be careful what you say about me at lunch. And as they're talking, the servers are listening, and as they hear us talk about helping one another and doing things for the kingdom of God and, and being there for one another, those servers are listening. The world is listening. And they're watching how we treat one another. And can I be honest? Sometimes it doesn't look so good to the world how we treat one another. Oh, well, they're that denomination and that denomination is just, it's not even a denomination, it's a demonic nation, right? And I mean, we just, we we trash one another before the world and the world goes, why would I want to be a part of that? Hello? We got to love one another. He said, love one another, serve one another, and by doing this, the world is going to know. It's like when your friend is going through a crisis and you find out, man, they're not a part of the body of Christ or they're not a part of a local church. Maybe they are a Christian, but they're just not part of a local church. And you go, man, why not? And they're like, well, this and that and church hurt and that person did this and that and the other. And you can say to them, man, you know what? People are people, but let me tell you something. When you're a part of the body of Christ, when you find a body of Christ, you will find people who may not be perfect, but they love one another. And if if you're out, man, come in, come in, come in, and we will show you some love. Love one another. Finally, we not only serve Jesus, our family, and the body of Christ, but we serve the least and we serve the lost. Jesus entered Jericho one day, and he was just passing through. And there he encountered a man named Zacchaeus, who was a very top-of-his-game tax collector. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was what the Bible calls a chief tax collector. He was chief among the tax collectors. He was, he was like, man, he's getting all the awards at the uh, company party. I mean, he was high. Which meant, before the Jewish people, he was incredibly hated. 
And as he climbed up into that sycamore tree, as you maybe learned if you were in kids' church one day, he climbed into that sycamore tree, the Lord, for he wanted to see. And as he began to look at Jesus, Jesus looked at him. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to have dinner with you. I'm gonna, I want lunch at your house today. Oh, there's so much here that I could go off on, so much here. But let me tell you, Zacchaeus came down and he began to put his faith in Christ. Zacchaeus was transformed from the inside out. And we see from that encounter, he's began to give the money away. And anybody he cheated, he said, I'm going to give him double. And he was just open-handed, open-armed. How many of you know when you're generous, you must have Jesus in your life? I told you there's so much there. But this is where we get this statement in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. At the end of that, people begin to criticize Jesus. And then this is Jesus' answer about how he treated Zacchaeus. He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Zacchaeus took Jesus' words and it transformed his life. But Jesus took that transformed life and made Zacchaeus an example that every little child that will ever grow up in church will hear about that wee little man. But that wee little man's heart was so transformed, so touched, so it, just transformed by the power of Christ that now he's an example to all of the least in the lost. We must preach the gospel while living out the gospel. We must feed their soul while sometimes feeding their face. We must love them enough to not leave them where they are at. We must give the thirsty something to drink. When Johnny was telling his story, I was immediately reminded of the time that that happened to me when I was on a missions trip. It was either El Salvador or Nicaragua. I can't remember which one. But we had toys, but we ran out of candy. We literally got down to this little bag, and it was our last program. And it was a school that was unexpected. We weren't sure if we were going to get to go. And when we talked to the principal, they said, well, you know, I think it's just going to be about, you know, like 20 kids. And we're like, okay, we've got enough candy. We've got enough toys. We've got enough food. We can do this program. And for some reason, all of the teachers of the school said, what? A break for an hour? It's on. And about 200 kids came into the courtyard. No joke. And we were like, oh, no. And the keeper of the candy, because you've got to have a keeper of a candy around a lot of kids. And so the keeper of the candy came to us and said, uh, we don't got enough candy for these kids. And the program's coming to an end. And so this is what we said. You're the keeper of the candy. You deal with it. I mean, we got enough problems of our own. We're trying to do all this and this and this. You go ahead and take care of the candy. And, man, we're praying for kids. Kids are getting healed. Kids are getting set free. We're, we're praying for all these kids that are getting saved. We're like, just go take care of the candy. Who cares? Well, that keeper of the candy cared. Amen? When you're a servant, you care for what God has given you. And that keeper of the candy, who hap happens to be also a CEO of a company, she said, okay, to her other keepers of the candy helpers, let's pray. And the first thought that she came to was this. We're going to go ahead and give one piece. Normally we gave handfuls. We're going to give one piece of each, maybe, just maybe. We'll get it to the smaller kids and we'll tell the older kids, sorry, we're out. That's literally the first thought that came to her. And so she started handing out one piece of candy. Can you imagine Kids who only see candy about once a month in their life, maybe that, are waiting for one piece. And they handed out the one piece, and they went, thank you. Any more? And so here, that line started. And she, the keeper of the candy, got convicted. And she prayed again, and she said, Lord, would you multiply this candy? And do you know what started happening? 
she said, I can't stand to look on these pig faces. Just give it until it's empty, until it's gone. So they started handing handfuls of candy to each kid. They got to 20 kids. They got to 30 kids. They got to 40 kids. They got to 100 kids. They got to 150 kids. And they kept handing candy. And some of them got in line twice because they're sneaky. And they're so cute you can't stop it. Every single one of those kids in that entire program. And at the end of it, the keeper of the candy had a bag of candy left over. I could tell you this story over and over again. Because when we serve, we don't serve out of our abundance. We serve out of his abundance. We serve out of what he is giving us. And when he hands it to us, it will be multiplied and it will never end. It will never end. I want the worship team to come. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. There's more that I have to share, but I'm, I don't feel like I'm supposed to share it today. Because I want you to see something. So we're going to be launching something soon. Because I don't just want to preach messages. I want to take action. I don't want you to just hear things. I want you to take action on this. <clears throat> and so a text went out this morning. And if you didn't receive it, you can talk to Miss Zoe about how to get that signed up on the text messages. But we're going to be launching something at New Day that I believe will set the course for our future. It's not another program. It's not another service. It's not another cool idea. But I believe it will change hearts. It will change attitudes. It will impact families. And I truly believe that this single action will cause a ripple effect to go locally, regionally, and globally. I truly believe this. What is it? I can't tell you right now. Because the Lord's still working on it, on us. But I can tell you this, where is it based? On what I just preached. That we have got to become servants in this selfish society. We have got to come to a place in our lives where we say, God, here I am. Like Samuel. Lord, your servant is listening. Do you know that Samuel, the scripture says, in his time became the greatest, greatest prophet to Israel up to his time. And it says he was so great that he did not let one word fall to the ground. In other words, every word that Samuel calculated, every word that came out of his mouth was inspired by God. And he didn't waste one word. And how did he start? What I just said. As a little boy saying, here I am. Your servant is listening. Would you stand with me right now? Here's the altar call. I'm going to ask you three questions. And I want you to just close your eyes for a moment and I want you to respond to the Holy Spirit that is speaking to you. First of all, who is God calling you to serve? Just ask the Holy Spirit that right now. Say, Holy Spirit, who do I need to be serving right now? Because some of you are amazing at serving your families. You're incredible. You, are, you work a... 40, 50 hour a week job, you come home, you make meals, you, you take care of kids, you, you make sure that they're okay, you, you come alongside of them. You're a blessing to your spouse. Maybe you're great at that, but I believe the Holy Spirit is 
is tapping on you right now saying, I want you to serve this segment as well. Maybe he's even saying, you serve others well, but I want you to sit at my feet and serve me. Who is God calling you to serve? Secondly, where is God calling you to serve? You see, there is a proximity that he has for you. It may be your neighborhood. It may be this body of believers right here in South Lake. It may be somewhere in your workplace. I don't know, but where is God calling you to serve? And finally, how is God calling you to serve? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to tell you, we're not done, but these altars are open. If you want to come and find a place or you want to find a place right where you're at, we're just going to continue to play for a few minutes, then I'll come back in a minute. But I want you to find that place and I want you to, I don't want you to just rush out of here. You guys just keep it just right there. It's perfect. I want you to find that place and say, God, who do you want me to serve? Where do you want me to serve and how can I best serve? Where is my place of service right now, Lord, that you are asking of me? Come on, come on, just respond, just respond. Find a place, just respond, just find a place for the next two, three, four minutes. Don't rush out, don't get antsy. Just ask him, come on, come on. This altar is open, you can come right down here, you can stand, you can kneel, you can turn around in your seat, but find that place. Don't ask one another, ask him. Who is it, Holy Spirit? Speak, speak, speak. Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, speak. Your servants are listening. Your servants are listening. Oh, your servants are listening. Mm, we say yes, we say yes. We say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. As he speaks to you, just respond. Just respond, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I'll serve who you want me to serve. Yes, Lord, I'll serve where you want me to serve. Yes, Lord, I'll serve how you want me to serve. I know you'll provide the gifting. I know you'll provide everything I need. So, Lord, I'll serve you how you want me to serve you. about 30 more seconds. Just let the Holy Spirit speak and respond.
hear the Holy Spirit saying that there's someone either watching or in this room that you need to say yes to Jesus again. You need to say, yes, Lord, I will serve you. I've been serving my own selfish interests, my own selfish ways. And I even hear the Lord saying that you served me at one time with wholehearted gladness. But you've allowed the things of this world, you've allowed this world's ways and this world's ideas to infect your soul. And it's time for a cleansing. It's time to say, yes, Jesus, I'll serve you anywhere you want, any, any way you want, to whoever you want, Lord, I will serve you, Jesus. I will serve you and stop serving myself, stop serving in the way I want to serve, and that's the only way I can serve. God, I will stop doing that, and I will serve you wholeheartedly. Lord, how can I serve you? It's my pleasure to serve you, Lord. It's my pleasure to serve you, God. Say yes to him now. Say yes to him now. Say yes to him now. Surrender your heart. Surrender your life afresh and anew. Say yes to Jesus. would you stand with me? Would you take somebody's hand? Most of the people in this room and even watching online are a part of New Day Church. And if you're not yet, we'd love for you to be a part. But this is what I feel like. I feel like the Lord wants us to pray a corporate prayer. A corporate prayer of recommitting to serving Him, no matter what name is out there, no matter, it's not about us, it's about Him. And would you just come together, and I'm going to pray a prayer, and would you just come into agreement with this prayer, saying, Lord, here we are as this local church body called New Day Church, and we recommit to a service, a life of serving You, Jesus. We recommit to that, that it's not about our name, it's about your name. That it's not about our fame, it's about your fame. It's not about about what we get to do, it's about partnering with you, Holy Spirit. So we renew our heart to be a church that serves like Jesus. And God, we recommit to loving and serving our families, God. God, that we will love our spouses, that we will love our children, that we will love our aged parents, that we will love those that you have placed in our family, God. God, even those who do not know you, God, we will love them by serving them. That they would see Jesus in our acts of service. God, and we recommit to you that we will serve one another in love. That we will not do this for a position or a title. We will not do this to gain access or a place of authority over one another, but we will serve one another in love. God, that it's not about titles. It's not about our positions. But it's about our posture of serving you, God, and serving one another. God, we recommit to serving the body of Christ. This local body and those that are part of your greater body. We will love them. Even when we don't agree with them. God, we will come into agreement under the name of Jesus. God, we will come into alignment with those who love your name and love your word. And lastly, God, we recommit to serving the lost, the lost in our community, God. God, we will not ignore them as if they weren't there. 
We will not just drive into this community and drive out of this community every Sunday morning. We say, God, we are here to serve. We are here to serve this community. God, and we say we are here to serve our region however you want us to serve the people in our neighborhoods, the least, the lost, the teenager, the child, the broken family, that teenager, that young adult who's strung out. God, we say we will serve them even as you serve Zacchaeus. God, and we will serve the globe in Jesus' name. God, we may not be able to do it all, but we, through your power, can do for one or 10 or 50 what we wish we could do for the whole world. So God, where you give us influence, we will serve. We will serve in the name of Jesus. Now, will you say this after me? Say, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, we commit commit. as this local body body. to serve Jesus Jesus. in any way way. he wants us us. to whoever he brings in our path. And we will even seek out the lost where they are at and serve them according to to the power that the Holy Spirit gives us in Jesus' name. And then would you add this, in the name of Jesus, we will serve all with the resources from heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Amen. Will you hug somebody's neck And give us three minutes. Give us three minutes. There's, go ahead and just sit down for just a moment. Babe, if you could bring me that microphone right here. There's, there's a couple of ministries that we want to make you aware of. And Joni's going to introduce the first one. So, would you come? want to introduce this ministry to you that's actually in our local community so go ahead introduce what you're doing yeah Yeah, go ahead okay so this is my friend carolyn and she is here representing uh well i'll just let you tell let me let me just let you tell the rest of the story okay (laughs) i'm here with discovery village south lake so if anybody has um friends aging parents loved ones Um, who are in need of assisted living or memory care. We also have skilled nursing. We have that all on the same campus. So if that is something you're in need of or you think you could be in need of, I'll be standing out there and you can come talk to me. It's the table that had the donuts on it. Yes. Yes. So we appreciate that. We had a lot of donuts today. Yes, we appreciate that. (laughs) Amen, amen. Thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate that. And then... We also uh, want to have Sean come. He's got a table out there. All right. A few of you know about it, but not everybody knows. Afternoon, church. So the, our Salt and Light Ministry, which is which I uh, remind people of on the third Sunday of each month, is about building biblical citizens. Right. One of the realms yeah. that we live in is the civil, you know, society and government. Yeah. And so uh, that's what it's all about. And I was, uh, I, was, I was reading my daily Bible today, and I'm up to Chronicles. Awesome. And so one of the things that uh, jumped out was, do not fear or be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. And that's First Chronicles 28, 20. And given the news mm-hmm. and the impending world war, blah, 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 all this different stuff, that's a great, <laughs> yes. that's, that's a great thing to remember. And um, here's a quiz, right? Here is, here is a part of a speech from one of the presidents in the 19th century. I want you to think in your mind, who said this? This country was founded by men and women who were dedicated or came to be dedicated to two propositions. First, a strong religious conviction. 
And secondly, a recognition that this conviction could flourish only under a system of freedom. I think it is appropriate that we pay tribute to this great constitutional principle which is enshrined in the First Amendment of the Constitution. The principle of religious independence, of religious liberty, of religious freedom. But I think it is also important that we pay tribute and acknowledge another great principle, and that is the principle of religious conviction. Yeah. Religious freedom has no significance unless it is accompanied by conviction, and therefore the Puritans and the Pilgrims of my own section of New England, Puritan of Boston, that was good. Um, the Quakers of Pennsylvania, the Catholics of Maryland, the Presbyterians of North Carolina, the Methodists and Baptists who came later all shared these two great traditions, which like silver threads have run through the warp and the woof of American history. No man who enters upon the office to which I have succeeded can fail to recognize how every president of the United States has placed special reliance upon his faith in God. Mm -hmm. Every president has taken comfort and courage when told that the Lord will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Yeah. While they came from a wide variety of religious backgrounds and held a wide variety of religious beliefs, each of our presidents in his own way has placed a special trust in God. Those who were the strongest intellectually were also the strongest spiritually. Amen. The guiding principle and prayer of this nation has been, is now, and shall ever be. In God we trust. Amen. 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 Anybody take a guess who said that? 19th century president? John F. Kennedy. Wow. Wow. And so that was before they started to attack God, take him out of school, mm -hmm. yeah. take him out of churches, take him out of the government. Yeah. And so we need to recommit. I pray every day for a revival. Amen. Locally. Yes. Regionally, in this country especially. Amen. Things that, you know, the pastor's right. Things like servanthood, duty, honor, humility, and respect are things of the past. That's Let's right. bring them back. Come on. Right? Amen. So get involved, get informed, and let's make America godly again. Mm, amen. Thank you so much. Amen. And will you stand with that? I want us to pray. I didn't, I, you maybe saw I hesitated at the beginning of my message because I wasn't sure if I should do it then or now. And now is the time. Many of you saw or maybe have heard what started happening last night with this renewed attack on, attack on Israel. And I don't know about you, but I can't read all the newspaper articles and, and half the news. Well, I would say 90% of the news I don't trust. And so I don't know all of it, but my sources are telling me that this is not just Iran that has attacked Israel, but it's also seven other major nations. And so I'm not coming to alarm you. I'm coming to say we need to pray, just like Sean said. We need to pray. Is this Ezekiel 38 beginning to play out now? I don't know. I can't tell you that. I can't. But I will tell you this. These are definitely the shakings. You hear me, church? Don't look at America or Africa, continent of Africa, or any other nation to wonder, are we getting close? You look at Israel. That's how you know. That's how you know. And it rumbles from there. So something is happening. And I think that for those of us that are sensitive, you know that this is not just another attack. Amen? And so we need to be in prayer. And I was talking to Brother Jean, who is a, a native of Lebanon. I want you to add this to your prayer. Because as Brother Jean so aptly said, because he has many extended family members still in Lebanon, that the Lebanese people are victims. I said the Lebanese people are victims of an, of an ungodly regime. Do you know how many believers are in Iran right now? Hundreds of thousands. The fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. We have brothers and sisters there. And they're under the heavy arm of these demonic regimes. So do not place all of those people in with these demonic leaders. So your prayer should be for our brothers and sisters in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, where God is doing an incredible revival work in Syria right now. We need to be praying for our brothers and sisters who are there. Amen? And we need to pray for Israel.
So can we just lift up our voice right now? God, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And you commanded in your word to pray for the peace of Israel. We know that Israel is your time clock. And that we can see from Israel what is happening and what is coming. So God, we just come before you not in fear, not what man or bombs or anything else may bring. We come to you partially excited that things are happening, but God also partially saying, Lord, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We join with John the Revelator and say, come Lord Jesus, come. We're asking you to come in great power and glory. Come with revival. Come with outpourings. Come with signs, wonders, and miracles in Iran, in Lebanon, in Iraq. Come in Syria. Come in these nations. Would you pour out your spirit? God, I know you're appearing to many people in dreams and visions, and there's a vast revival happening. God, would you increase it in Jesus' name? God, and I pray for our Jewish individuals, God, that are there, Lord, that do not know you, God. Would you wake them up? Would you wake them up to their true Redeemer? Would you wake them up to the true Messiah? God, would you wake them up, and would you wake America up at the same time, God? God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would wake up the church that we would see that the master is calling, that the master is coming, that the time is drawing nigh. And God, we have a work to do. We have a people to serve. We have a mission to accomplish. God, get a hold of our hearts. Let us stop fighting and bickering over the small things and begin to come together to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this all in the mighty, matchless, precious name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Do you agree with that? Can you just give a shout? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And as you're going, I want to leave you with this victorious thought. John and Maria are headed to Vietnam because all of their resources have come in. Woo. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an incredible day. Uh, that was kind of a rough one, Tom. And like, I, I slid into some wrong notes, and like, as soon as I did, I was like, "Oh my gosh!" Like, I got to get going on this. So I slid into a one instead of a four, like two different times. And I'm like, "Oh my god!" Honestly, that's what it's.